He said, you can take her. You know, so the animal rescue team came and un untied the chain, the heavy chain. And you should have watched the video. The dog just leaped out, didn't even look back at the previous owner that had taken care of her for many years, just leaped, back, leaped forward in, right into the car, right into the stranger's car. It was set free. It was liberated. It was so happy. It was expressing its joy by wagging its tail and leaping into this car. That's what redemption is. Maybe for you, uh, some of you, school was like that. When you were finally done with your school and you earned a hard-earned degree, you got the diploma, and you're released from academia forever. Redemption. That's redemption, right? Some of you served in the army. And when you're, all your obligations and duties to your nation was done, you're relieved, you're released. That is redemption. And when we were released from the burden, the guilt of sin in our lives through Jesus, that was redemption. It was bought with a price. How can we achieve acceptance by God? It was because Jesus paid the price. He released us. Like the dog that, that was chained uh, heavily to the post, heavily to sin, Jesus released us. And that's how we have been redeemed. That's how we have been free. There's a second word that Christ did, represents what Christ did for us in order for us to be made righteous with God. And that word, second word is verse 25 again, propitiation. I know this isn't the word you, you use every day at your dinner table. Honey, um, you know, I've been propitiated today and I feel so happy. It's not a word that you use very much, right? It's a very abstract word, but it is a word. Uh, it's a beautiful word, propitiation. It's, the meaning is that God is satisfied with you. That's what it means, propitiation. It means that God's wrath was dissolved. It, the, the wrath, the, the tangled wrath around your neck, it's been re resolved. That's what it means, propitiation. It's like when you have a acid heartburn, you know, your stomach ache, heartburn, and you take like Tums, or uh, acid reliever, it solves, it, it softens, it dissolves the burn, heartburn in your, in your, in your um, um, stomach. Just so, Jesus was the propitiation. He was the solvent for the wrath of God. He extinguished the wrath of God. Is that still a bit abstract? This word, propitiation, is actually derived from another word. It's a picture from the Old Testament. I want to explain this concept to you. Listen very carefully. This word propitiation is hilasterion in, Hebrew, in Greek, which doesn't much, mean much to you right now. But the image behind that word comes from the Ark of the Covenant. Remember the Ark of the Covenant in the old days, that you know, big box that the uh, you know, priest used to carry around in the desert, in the wilderness, in Moses' days? God had Moses and the people build this Ark of the Covenant. They put the Ten Commandments in there. The manna was in there. And the rod of Aaron was there. It was a reminder of the presence of God. And if you look at the Ark of the Covenant, on the cover of it, there were two angels called seraphim. And they were looking at each other. They were looking down. They couldn't dare face up heaven. This piece of article of furniture was placed in the Holy of Holies, in the tabernacle of God. This was the place of God where God met his high priest once every year. Once every year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the priest would kill an animal and bring the blood into the Holy of Holies and would sprinkle the blood on the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, which is called the Mercy Seat. Why is it called the Mercy Seat? It's where Shekinah glory, God's glory is supposed to be seen, and when God sees the blood, the sacrificial blood, he is satisfied. His righteousness, his holiness is satisfied among his people. He sees that somebody paid the price for the sins of the people of Israel. 
and for the entire year, their sins are forgiven. And God was satisfied. They did this every year because the animal sacrifice was imperfect. The priest was imperfect. It was an imperfect system. But this word propitiation has that image behind it. It's a holy word. It's a beautiful word where God's holiness, his wrath is satisfied in the blood of this animal. But the Bible is saying Jesus became our propitiation. Look with me back in verse 24 once again. 25, rather. Whom God, Jesus, God put forward as a propitiation by not animal blood, but by Jesus' blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. You know, God only recognizes, he only receives, accepts the blood of Jesus and nothing else. Everything else is imperfect. Everything else is ungodly, unrighteous acts on our part. Nothing that we can do, nothing, not one thing can satisfy God's wrath, his holy and just righteousness. Jesus sacrifice alone. His perfect sacrifice was the only remedy for the wrath of God. These are not my words, but the, but the words of the Bible. I want you to read with me in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. This is what it says. Jesus entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Amen. The reason that God is satisfied with us is not because of our, any deed that we have done, any good, righteous, any religious activity, or any discipline that we might have uh, ex executed. It was because that God saw the blood of his son, the perfect sacrifice, once for all, and he was satisfied. And he redeemed. Jesus redeemed us from our slavery to sin. And just like the scripture says, God passed over former sins as a result. You and I are remind, reminded again, once again, in Moses' days, the ten plagues of Egypt. Remember? When God was rescuing his people, he sent the last tenth plague all over the land of, his, uh, of, of uh, Egypt. And he sent his death angel to pass over all the homes and killed every firstborn child of the household, except the houses, the doorposts, which had the blood of the lamb uh, painted over the doorpost. And when the death angel saw the, the blood on the doorpost, he passed over as if there's no sin, as if they're righteous. When they saw the sacrifice of the blood, they passed over. That's what God is doing here through Jesus. When God sees the blood of Jesus on the cross, sacrificial blood, he passed over you and I, my sins. It's not that we are holy and righteous in any way, but God passed over. He ignored. He recognized us as righteous because of the sacrificial blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. How are we satisfied by God? It was through the uh, redemptive sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It was the propitiation sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to get the real question though. How can you and I be satisfied by God? How are we recognized by God? Yes, that's the fact that Jesus, he paid the price for God, uh, that satisfied God. But that, what does that have to do with me? Which comes to the second point. God is satisfied with Jesus Christ's sacrifice alone, but God is also satisfied with our faith in Jesus. Amen? Can we say it together? God is satisfied. God is satisfied 
with our faith in Jesus, with our faith in Jesus. Because God is satisfied with Jesus, he is satisfied with us who, are, who put our faith in Jesus. Paul goes on in verse 27 that there is no boasting. You and I cannot boast of our merits in any way for the acceptance by God. Where, what becomes our boasting? It is nullified. It is excluded, he says. By what kind of law? It was not law of works on our part. No, but by the law of faith, he says. Faith is receiving. Faith is saying, I agree, I consent, I want it. It's like receiving a vaccine. You have the choice not to receive the vaccine, right? But you do want to receive it, most of you. And we cannot boast that, oh, I got vaccine and you haven't because all of us, it's available to all of us for free. You know, at least as time goes, it will be available to all. And it, it is a gift to us by the government, or by those who have worked so hard to make it, to develop it. It is a gift to all humanity. But no matter how much prevalent the gift is, unless you have it in your arm, it means nothing to you. How do we receive this vaccine of salvation, of redemption? I want to highlight from our passage of scripture a recurring phrase that comes back over and over and over back to us again. In verse 22, look with me, verse 22, real quickly. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus, Christ Jesus. Verse 26, look with me. Again, down, 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 26. It says, so that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Verse 27, the next verse, it says, by a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Verse 28 as well. For we hold that no one is justified, uh, but uh, that one is justified by what? Faith, apart from works of law, work, uh, the law. Verse uh, 30 uh, also, it says, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised also through faith. The last verse, 31. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? Again, I'll ask you a question. How do we receive this gift of the righteousness of Jesus? It is by faith. God is satisfied with our faith in Jesus. As I said, no matter how much prevalent the vaccine might be out there, you know, the government is making a lot of effort. We can see, you know, they're buying in a lot of tons and tons of vaccine, trillion, billions of vaccine probably, for, to be distributed all over the country. You know, they're buying as much as they're producing, I believe. Um, and, uh, you know, it's all over the, the country, all over the world, let's say it is, but no matter how much prevalent it is, if it's not in your arm, it's of no use. It has no effect. It doesn't give you life. No matter how much crosses all across the nation in the U.S. there might be, how many churches there might be, how much churches all over the world there might be, how much Bibles you might have even in your homes, if you do not have that vaccine, the righteousness of Jesus in your heart, it does no good to you. You are not satisfied by God. You are not accepted by God if you do not have the vaccine of Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Jesus. I want to emphasize faith aspect one more time. Romans 1.17, he said it very clearly, the past chapter, Romans chapter 1, verse 17. Paul says, as it is written, the righteous, the accepted one, shall live by faith. Amen. So I want to ask you this question. How come there are people who don't believe, who don't have faith? Maybe they can't have faith. Why is that? For us to trust in somebody, we got, they got to earn our trust, right? For us to invest, especially our eternity, if, our, if, it's, if it's our life is at stake, we better know that they are trustworthy, shouldn't we? 
If you're going to take the vaccine, you better know that they're, they're having many critical uh, clinical uh, um, observation and experimentation and you know, it was successful. You better know the science that, you know, this trustworthy and a lot of people are taking it because of that. If you're going to entrust your soul to God, if you're going to entrust your soul and, and <coughs> receive Jesus in your heart, shouldn't you know, shouldn't you have to know that he is trustworthy? Indeed, that's what God did. God sent his son 2,000 years ago as a proof that he is the son of God. And he had his own son nailed to the Roman cross and die a bloody death, a sacrificial death, a death of redemption, a death of propitiation for us 2,000 years ago. And he put it on display for the whole world to see. And he recorded it in history for all world to believe in. We have seen so many people, millions, billions, trillions of people throughout the history of our humanity have received this Jesus and have lived. God is showing to us this morning, am I not trustworthy having given my son to you 2,000 years ago, not only in scripture, but in history? Amen, God. He is trustworthy to put our faith in. That's why Jesus, God is inviting us to put our faith in Jesus, to be reconciled with God, to be accepted, to be, to be, be a child of God. That is the invitation of the Bible, and that is the reminder that we are reading from the Word of God. Why are we remembering this time of Lent? Why are we commemorating, commemorating and worshiping this time of the Passion when Jesus suffered? Because whenever we see the cross, it is a reminder that he is trustworthy. He has done what he said he would do. It, it is a reminder that I have put my faith in this Jesus and I am satisfied by God, that I'm accepted. I am a son. I'm a daughter of God. It is a reminder. So that's why year after year, whenever Easter comes around, we remember the passion of Christ. We remember the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I remember reading a, a, a preacher, a preacher gave this illustration. One preacher described it as if you and I were standing uh, a short 100 yards away from a dam of water that is 10,000 miles high and 10,000 miles wide. Imagine you're standing before this great dam. All of a sudden, the dam is breached. And you're definitely afraid, right? Afraid is maybe understatement. You're terrified, horrified. You're stoned. You're frozen. Your foot is stuck. Feet is, are, are stuck on the ground. You can't move a muscle. The torrent flow of water is crashing toward you and I. But right before it hits you, the, cra the, the ground opens up. And it soaks up every bit of that water into itself. At the cross, Christ drank the wrath of God, every drop of it. He drank it at the cross. Every wrath, all the wrath that was due on us, that we were to be condemned with, he, dropped, he drank to the last drop. He turned over the cup and said, it is finished. This is a historical fact. History attests to it, and the Bible confirms it. And now Jesus, he is extending his arm to us. This is my demonstration of my love to you. Receive it. Receive the vaccine. How can you and I show our faith this Lent, this Passion season. We can show it, first of all, if you have not, never received Jesus in your heart, by receiving Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. Jesus, I believe that you are the propitiation before God. You have redeemed, loosened the noose, the, the sin, the chain around from my neck through your sacrifice. I believe, I accept. What a what more honor can we give Jesus than believing, receiving wholeheartedly 
this message of the gospel. And if you have already received this gospel, how can we honor, how can we express our faith this Lent and Passion Week? I want to encourage you to do this. Have you changed as a result of your encounter with Jesus? Has your life dramatically changed 180 degrees? Maybe it was gradual, so you didn't notice it along the, among the years. But as you look back, wow, it's like B.C. and A.D. It's totally day and night, or actually, let's just say night, night and day. I have totally been changed. I wasn't like this before. Do you have a story like that? I want you to think about how Jesus has touched you and changed you. Maybe I can liken it to a funeral memorial service. When you go to a funeral service, the members of the family come up to the podium and they praise the late person, you know, how they were good to them, what they did for them. You know, Jesus has died. He's resurrected, but he's died as well. We can use this period of Lent to do like a eulogy of Jesus. You know, I was such a wretched sinner, but Jesus came into my life. He loosened the noose from my neck of sin and he was the propitiation. I know I am satisfied with God because of Jesus. Let's remember what Jesus did for you, how your life.